Uh, and Hector, but we've got Haven Aegis and then Dragon Dread, and then over on Hactorax's side we've got Snow Daria, so he's the only other player to bring it aside from Suzoni, Bat Blood, Mother and Odal Shadow, and it looks like it's going to be a Shadow Mirror to kick Run. things Run. off. Run. There it is, Hactorax first underwear, and this is important. Talk to me about these two different Shadowcraft decks. Who do you see coming out on top, and how are their mulligans playing out, guys? Absolutely. So, uh, honestly, what we're looking for, since Hackrox is bringing more of a like late game type of mid shadow list, like he's got, as you can see, the Skull Cradle Widow for extra card draw, unless that's early. He's playing the Dead Moros and things like that. Um, it's just, it's going to be interesting to see who draws more power cards, right? And if the card value that Hackrox gets out of his extra card draw with Skull Cradle Widow and things like that actually make a difference. What do you think, Aya? Well, what I think is that Underwear is probably hoping that his dice rolls are on point today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, I say that because, you know, you got Attendant and Erd. You know how, yeah. For those who don't know, um, I am not a huge fan of Erd and Shadow. Um, but I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just not a fan of it. And... Um, since he's going second, like, it feels, I don't know, I, I don't even know, and there's a Dead Morose, I, I'm, oh, yeah, 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 that's right, Underwear was the one with Dead Morose, not Hackrock, so Hackrock is actually yeah. playing cards that you would normally see with Dead Morose, such as Skull Cradle Widow and things like that, so it looks like they both kind of have some techie things for the mirror, Hackrock's going for more of the, uh, the card draw element, Underwear going for more of the big stats and maybe a little bit of life gain, because, as we know, Mid Shadow is one of the only decks that doesn't really have access to life gain, and it's a deck that can play into the later stages of the game itself. It can go into turn 8, turn 9, turn 10. And without any life gain at all, you might be in a situation where you can't really come back. But I guess Dead Moros does give you that extra little benefit. Even if it only gains you one or two life, that might be just enough to take you out of reach for an Ektar turn so that you can come back that game. So, interesting choice. Dead Moros, man. I'm I'm gonna be shocked by that all day. <laughs> okay, so um, playing the serve standard turn five play here. And for those who don't know, Cerberus is a card that uh, when it comes into play, it will add a Coco and a Mimi to your hand. And uh, what Coco does is it gives you one of your followers plus two plus zero, and Mimi will just do two damage to an enemy. Period. Mm-hmm. Target or removal. Very high value card. You'll see it in most shadow lists because of that value. I imagine that uh, Underwear might have cut some number of servers to add Dead Moros to the deck uh, just to keep the curve consistent. So, I don't understand. interesting to see if the lack of serves will affect it. Well, we're about okay. to see Dead Moros get played. And there it is. He gained one off of it. He popped his... Uh, Pop this attendant, he gets the lich, kills the Serb, so um He's in a eh, he's in okay spot. I mean there's really no way to kill this Demoros. Right, exactly. This Demoros <laughs> might just stick I, around. And I, very I, interesting I, to note that the interaction between Erd and Demoros actually allows you to keep a follower in place. So that might be the reason he's leaning towards the uh the Erd plan, because of Demoros. That's that's fair. I'm, yeah, okay. Getting so, tricksy with it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I will say that I do like that um, people are using these very underutilized cards. Um, despite my initial reaction to the card being used, I like that. I like seeing people spice their deck up with just something just a little different. And Debmaros certainly qualifies as a little different. Absolutely. And it's it's really nice to see stuff like that, too, because in a tournament setting such as this, it's really nice to break up your tendencies, essentially. So if you have another player basically practicing against your play style, your decks from week to week, that kind of stuff, if you don't mix anything up, it's going to be really easy to counterplay you because they know exactly what you're doing. You brought the same lineup, you brought the same decks. When you spice it up a little bit, it changes just that little bit that maybe they haven't played that matchup enough with the, against those specific cards to know what to do on those turns, and it can give you that little tiny bit of an edge that maybe you didn't have before. Good enough. True. 
So we see Underwear uh, really missing on his dice roll right there. He really wanted to hit the Odile with the Lurching Corpse. He missed it. He ended up hitting the Bone Chimera instead. That feels awful. And then he had to actually use his evolution point to take out the Odile. And then he hits him just, with an did emote. He, did he, he not just attack came. with Demeros? I or don't think that he did. No. Oh well, no, no. Well, no. He didn't. Did I first... I... <laughs> Underwear. No. No, bro. I... I don't think he attacked. If if he with... did, he killed he killed one of the other followers, and I just missed it. But in any case, no, he did no. comes down no. to show who's so boss right now. Basically, going to close the gap of this ten this ten health that Underwear is sitting here with. So he's going to put him at two, which basically puts him dead to rights to the to the Mimi in hand. So unless yeah. Underwear can kill him this turn, which it doesn't look like there's any possible way, this game's just over. Even without the Mimi, really, because of the full board, there's no way to clear this. Also to state, he didn't attack with the Demeros. He, he did not. Interesting. No, he didn't. I, maybe he's just afraid of Shadow Vengeance, but... I, <laughs> That's right, mate. Honestly, just a, just, a, just a nerves mistake, man. First game of the day. So, technically, he can clear the board, but again, he knows that Mimi and so Coco are in hand. Legend. Yeah. So he already, unfortunately, he already knows his doom is impending. Oof. And there it is. I mean, is he gonna? Is Hackdrax gonna go with the, the BM? Is he gonna do something <laughs> like play baby. Death Breath? Okay, he's not gonna do that. He's classy. He just emoted him. Okay. <laughs> just a little bit of the emotes. He, emotes are okay. Just the, that's like yeah. that's like half BM. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so it's yeah. like he could have. You know, he could have done, like, a whole bunch of stuff. He could have cocoed, then he could have played the uh, Death Breath, then he could have Mimi'd, or, he did, you know, like, he could have done all that. But he was classy. Now that we have the players on camera, it's awesome when they actually do BM. So, like, I'm not a big supporter, as you guys know, of BMing. But when you're both on camera, it adds an extra little element of spice and a little bit of personality. Um, but I'll, I'm always down for the classy take. So Hack Brock's being classy, can't hurt him. Word. Feels good. So now we've got Hackdorox bringing his rune deck. I'm interested to see what rune he's bringing this week. Oh yeah, that's right. Do we get to see? Yeah, Conjuring he's playing Force Conjuring week? Force. That's right. That's yeah. right. Oh he's playing yes. Conjuring Force. Yes. <laughs> so the first day player to adopt Zoni's idea of playing Conjuring Force. Let's see how this goes. All right. Well, on. just on principle, I, I have to root for Hack the Rocks. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because Conjure, you know, <laughs> like right. he's, he's playing Conjure. It's but the wild that card is, deck that we love to see. Yeah, and it's not so wild card anymore, though. I mean, uh, it's not right. so wild card. It is card a proven anymore. fact that Sazoni has not lost a single game with it in NGE yet. So, other players are starting to get the point. So far, just Hack the Rocks, but I assume that we'll see more Conjuring Force in the future. Whether it be just from yeah. Sazoni and Hack Rocks, or more players start to adopt it after they see how it fares well in a lot of the different matchups. Well, I can definitely tell you that Hack Rocks is probably loving his hand a lot right now. Um, yeah. Got the Kaleidoscopic Glow. He's going to have the Summon Snow next turn. Uh, he probably didn't want to draw that second Daria, though. But. Yeah. And just to go over quickly, since we didn't cover it in the first game, of how the decks kind of operate, Mid Shadow's a deck where it really likes to take a lot of value and early game aggression to uh, basically draw a bunch of cards with cards like Soul Conversion, which will let you sack a follower to draw two, Demeter, which is a two-play point, one-two, which does the same effect, kill, a, kill an allied follower, draw two cards, into those big value cards that we saw like Cerberus and Ektar to take over the game and win the game. Whereas Conjuring Force is kind of like a combo deck, where you play a lot of spells, you try to spell boost, which is the mechanic for Rune, essentially whenever you cast a spell, your cards get better, either reduce costs or more powerful. And then it tries to just play a bunch of 1-1s and either win through the Amulet Conjuring Force, which will give all of your followers plus one plus so when they cast a spell, or it tries to combo out on turns with Blade Mage, which is a 2-2 follower with Storm that you can then pump with Conjuring Force, or it just goes super card value and plays Daria and just keeps unloading board after board after board. So, very interesting deck and hard to play, as we've said. You're done for. Thank you for that very long synopsis. Like <laughs> yeah, hey man, some people some people want to get into it. You know what I'm saying? I hey, man, I'm, I'm messing with you, man. 
<laughs> Alright, so... Uh, Levy coming down. He's opting to go face here. Uh, really? I mean, do you go face there? With Not the snowman? trading seems a little greedy, but I think he's... Hacked Rocks is in at least the right mindset, so... He is thinking he is the aggro player in this matchup right now. He's not playing defensively because he thinks that Underwear is going to have to answer his board. He's essentially stating, I don't care if you think you're on the aggressive. Keep attacking me. I'm going to keep attacking you. And then we'll see who wins the race. So I think he's adopting the mindset of, I'm going to beat you. So answer me. You become the reactive player. Yeah, but he, he's going to be in for a very rude awakening in, <laughs> in oh, this, this turn specifically. Um, I think that from the perspective that we're looking at, I definitely think that Underwear is the aggressor here. Um, yes. Yeah, he is, he is definitely the aggressor. And that Soul Squasher couldn't have been better played. Um, I mean, he could have yeah, opted to play Serb, but I don't see why that he would. I actually really prefer, like, we see Serb being dropped on 5 in a lot of the games that we watch Shadow being played, but I think Serb's actually at its best on turn 6. Because you actually get to use the Mimi or the Coco, so you get a lot of value out of that single turn. So I like setup turns before that, and I think he's playing it quite perfectly. Underwear is setting up this board that's going to be really hard to deal with, as in, we know Conjuring Force doesn't really have big board wipes. It can deal right. with single followers and maybe up to two followers really well, especially with cards like Rhymeland, which will bounce a follower and fill your board up with one ones. But dealing with a big board like this, I don't know how he's going to be able to come back. Well, unfortunately, he doesn't have any Angelic Snipes, he doesn't have any Magic Missiles, he doesn't have any of the cards that he would really need to deal with even just a small fraction of this board. I mean, he can use uh, his Crimson Sorcery uh, and his Piercing Rune that's in hand, and that can deal with, you know, at least two things on board. So he could take out the 3-3 three, three, and the 2-2, two, two. he'll leave the, the other followers, but that's the most damage that he'll be able to take off the board with this hand. Like this hand, this hand started off really well and then like just kind of went down the drain. Um, right. This is like more like a standard. I think what he's got to do is basically just do what you said: use the piercing rune, use the crimson sorcery, and then really just refill with Daria because I don't think his hand is capable of dealing with the next few turns. And that's it. Looks like that's what he's going to do. Looks like he has mm -hmm. to play the Daria before the piercing rune just to get the value. Ooh. Oh man! And nothing so... else to do this turn. Yeah, he'll have, like, I think you have to evil the Daria and trade into that. And that feels awful because you know yeah. that you're going to run right into, you know, that you could potentially run into a Soul Squasher. So that feels terrible. Yeah, Soul Squasher, even the last Evolution Orb that Underwear has access to, um, Serb is easily going to be able to deal with this and get value out of the Coco. And he draws the Soul Squasher. <laughs> oh, my oh, man, that feels so bad. Free kill. He does have to trade one of the 1-1s one away just to get enough shadows in order to do it, but fair trade. It means he doesn't have to use his evolution orb defensively. He can now just use it offensively if he wants to. A little dangerous to use evolution orbs on 2 and 1 drops against Rune because they do have access to Kaleidoscopic Glow, which will then bounce it back to the hand so you kind of lose value off of the Evo, but I don't know if he cares about that right now. I don't think so. I think he should just press as much as he can. Like It's kind of like you know blood and water. You know, just, mm -hmm. just get him, man. And Hactorox's face looked really puzzled when <laughs> when he uh, that got that's like a soul squasher happened. He looked really mm -hmm. confused, and I think once he watches yeah. this, he'll realize, oh my god, he top decked it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best. When you go back and rewatch your games, like that's one of the things I've actually felt that was super interesting about uh, even me playing in tournaments before and watching other tournament players. It's like. Okay, so you don't know what your opponent has, and it's like, okay, they had the right card there, they had the right card there, but then you rewatch the game, and you're just like, they top-decked both of those in a row. Like, no! Why am I watching right. this game? <laughs> Almost makes you feel like you shouldn't rewatch, but you should. You should always get more information about your games. Hey, so yep. Angry. Very important to go back over your plays, make sure that, uh, wow. Yep. This man is just top-decking. to go with the Ektar. Yeah, over, over Thane here, which is not bad. It doesn't necessarily Actually, gar like guarantee him to win next time. No. no, it doesn't yeah. guarantee it, but I like that he's pushing damage. Again, he's just continuing pushing damage. And mm -hmm. um, not only that, but like he does have a servant hand. So if one thing survives, he just wins off of that. For next turn, so he plays a serve, uses a Mimi and Coco, or doesn't even have to do that. 
but still, you know what I mean. Uh, well, game's over. Yep. <laughs> game is over. Only only option he had was to rhyme one to big follow off off the board, but bouncing Ektar doesn't really save you any damage. In fact, increases the damage your opponent can deal, so. Underwear tying this up. Impressive. And apparently Hactorox felt the need to apologize for losing the game. It's okay, man. <laughs> right. It's okay. <laughs> Absolutely. I was just okay. so sorry I lost. I'm so sorry. <laughs> It's <laughs> good. All right, okay. so now we get to see Conjuring Force one more time, and now against Haven, where, as we've seen, I don't think... Uh, first of all, we haven't seen Conjuring Force lose yet, so that's its first loss that we've seen. But against Haven, um, it's where it's very favored, in my opinion. You've got the kaleidoscopic glows for their early plays. You've got out-of-hand damage that Haven can't really deal with. Haven usually tends to deal with things on the board very well, but dealing with stuff out of hand it has a little trouble with beyond life gain. Um, what are your thoughts about this uh, this Haven versus Conjuring Force matchup now that we've seen it a few times? Well, Haven versus Conjuring Force is kind of like it's definitely favored to Conjuring Force. You know, I think it comes down to uh, just how well the early game plays out for Haven. Um, mm -hmm. Like the better the early game, the more chance they have to win the game. Like where Haven decks, especially ones that are running Snow White, this is. Um, you know, tend to be like very I guess related, you know, maybe even Seraph a little, but definitely I guess. Um, those decks tend to be really, really slow. So mm -hmm. Conjuring Force has a really easy time getting to that late, the later part of the game. And um, Conjuring Force does a really good job of actually playing in all modes so it can play in the control mode it can play in the aggro mode it can play in like the mid-range it can do all of those things and hack rocks hand is not even bad right now um it's not amazing but it's not bad he does have the kaleidoscopic glow to balance that which is what he does yep as we talked about kaleidoscopic glow really 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 strong against haven uh it's actually at its best first haven because of cards like sacred plea and the beast color that we just saw because you don't even necessarily need to bounce it immediately um your turn your, your opponent's going to be setting up their turns especially with their amulets over the over the course of the next like two three four turns depending on how much countdown they have like beast call Ari, he's assuming on turn you know at first he was assuming on turn five but now he's assuming on turn seven that he's going to have a specific board if you kaleidoscopic glow that beast call off it could basically just represent an entire turn shift like your opponent now doesn't have a game plan for that turn so it's a very integral part of this matchup yep um so i think you just add the crimson sorcery hand and not trade so mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? I mean, I I think it's okay, uh, considering I, I like it. It, it. it forces it forces your opponent basically to to get the value out of Snow White, not basically getting extra attacks in when they shouldn't be. Um, realistically, it doesn't matter too much either way. So I, it doesn't matter if he attacks or not because the Snow White's going to operate the same way either to, either way. Um, so yeah, not a big deal. Okay. Well, Snow White going face for two. Um, those Snow Whites are going to be on the board for a while. Um, mm -hmm. And this is this is kind of the spot that Hactorox definitely doesn't want to be in. This is exactly what I was talking about in, in the uh, beginning, where I say it depends on the early game of uh, Haven. You know, how well they're doing in the early game. And right now, like, Underwear is doing incredibly well in the early game. And this is mid game yeah, now. These, but, you know, these, having having access to this many Snow Whites in play, especially against a deck that tries to fill up the board with one ones, basically just gives him a lot of value. Like those Snow Whites are going to be a, be able to trade into a lot of different one ones over the course of this uh, this mid game here, and that's not where you want to be at. Usually Haven doesn't have a way to deal with these boards until turn six, turn seven with Themis decrees, where they have to take up their entire turn to do it. Now Underwear actually has access to clear the board and do other things, and that's exactly what he's doing. Now, I like that he went for the board clear, because as we know, okay, you never leave the snowmen alive, all right? Not even one. You never leave them alive. Not even Golly, one. Here. Not even one. That's, that's when you start getting into trouble. That's because you don't really know how much spell boosting has been done to specific cards in the hand of the Conjuring Force player. So every turn that you leave the snowman alive past, say, turn 6, turn 7, then Conjuring Force can just come down and maybe unload a swath of spells, like 3, 4, 5 spells, 
and then just pump these snowmen out of control. So keeping the board clear is definitely what you want to be doing, and Underwear is fully prepared for this matchup. It looks like he knows exactly what he's doing here. I would be surprised if he didn't know. <laughs> yeah. I would be yeah. surprised if he didn't know. But he definitely knows what's going on. He's, you know, he's playing this matchup, and he's taking a drink. Go ahead, brother. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's right. But, yeah, he's... He knows this matchup. He knows what he's doing. Keep keeping the board clear. He knows he doesn't have access to a Themis Decree. He doesn't have access to a Dark John. He doesn't have anything like that. So he's just taking the time to just keep the board nice and clean. Golly, it's chilly here. And honestly, if Hackrox makes the same type of play that we saw Sazoni make yesterday against this exact same matchup where he plays that Conjuring Force out when he thinks it's safe too, Underwear also has the same tech card that Fatina did in Bahamut that can just wipe the board clean, including the Conjuring Force. So, realistically, I think the way that Hackrox has to win this game is to save the Conjuring Force, save the Blade Mage, and save as many low-cost spells as he possibly can to do 20 damage from a hand before this game is over. Because if he plays that Conjuring Force, he's going to have to get really lucky. But, as we saw yesterday, Sazoni actually got very lucky and top-decked the Conjuring Force on the turn he needed it to OTK after losing it to the Bahamut. So... It'll be interesting to see how he plays this match. Well, uh, he draws a Themis Decree, but he can't clear this turn. So, yeah, this is going to feel pretty bad. This is, we may very well see the reason you kill Snowman next turn. Yep. Hactrox has got to go in the tank and do his math and see how much damage he can put out with that Conjuring Force next turn. It might be enough, it might not. He also has access to an Evo. I'm not going to do that math. So. I'll let him do it. <laughs> <laughs> but he does have access to an Evo, so that is at least two additional damage off of an Evo. All right, so he, he just jammed the Conjuring Force. Uh, uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Right. Uh -oh. Did you see two uh -oh. Fates hands also in hand to pump out zero cost spells after Crimson Sorcery and Piercing Rain are cast? Uh oh. Uh, that's a zero costing face hand. Oh, oh man. Oh no, this is the. Oh, uh -huh. <laughs> it, 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 it no, man. There were two left over this time, but that's exactly what we're talking about. Hack the Rocks will take the 2 1 victory, and it's exactly like you guys mentioned. If you leave one snowman on board, it gets buffed up by Conjuring Force. It gets pretty beefy. You leave a second snowman, and that's times two of that. Plus you have that zero costing blade mage that's times three.